Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Data Diversity Smart Data webinar series with host Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss emerging hardware choices for modern AI data management. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our series speaker for today, Adrian, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage area includes cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, YLA 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SU New York, uh, Binghamton, and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Great. Thank you, Shannon. It's always uh, fun to be here every second Tuesday of the month. So today's topic, um, some people might look at it and think that it doesn't fit with the rest of the series because most of the time we talk about um, software-oriented topics or people think of it as software-oriented topics. And we've been looking over the course of this year at everything from machine learning to natural language processing, uh, really at a fairly abstract level. But what I wanted to do as we get near the end of the year is just do one session looking at um, some new trends in hardware that really support uh, some of the solutions that we've been talking about all year. And so I say emerging hardware choices for modern AI. What we'll talk about today, uh, or first of all, the, the rationale behind what's the importance of hardware and why you should care, even if you end up putting everything in the cloud and think that you're sort of outsourcing it, and it's no longer your responsibility. Uh, it's, there are some important choices to be made when you're picking your providers uh, in terms of what they're doing, because your choice of hardware uh, is still going to have an impact on system performance. So today, uh, let me find my thing here. Let me go right in and look at the agenda. Um, just a, a quick comment about hardware in general and why it is uh, what I'm calling the final frontier. And then we're going to look at the specific challenges that modern AI, and I'll give you a, a crisper definition of modern AI in a minute, uh, why modern AI has specific challenges that aren't really well met with conventional hardware architectures. Look at the importance of uh, doing things in parallel and some of the limits to parallel uh, execution of workloads. And then look at three uh, different approaches uh, that are in various stages of maturity and commercial readiness. Uh, neuromorphic GPUs and advanced memory solutions, uh, and quantum computing. We're not going to spend a lot of time on quantum computing, but I did want to include it, uh, as I was saying to Shannon before the um, before we started. Uh, you have to have at least a good cocktail party uh, knowledge of quantum if you want to survive in the world of modern AI. And we'll wrap it up with an overview of what's out there in the market uh, and make some recommendations in terms of adoption strategies, depending on the types of systems that you want to build. So the first slide today, the first real slide, uh, I left the old template and the old copyright on. This is something that I've used off and on for, for many years. Um, this particular slide, I think I used it a, um, uh, an MBA class I was teaching at uh, Boston College. The issue here is that over time, if we look at sort of the stack from hardware generically at the bottom, through operating systems, through application software and delivery. Over time, as functions mature, 
they tend to move from the top of the stack down. So you might see things uh, moving from a specific application into the operating system, uh, into a system where you're buying components instead of buying a complete application. Uh, and at some point, it moves all the way down into the hardware. And I like to talk about this as kind of the, the value migration, that as something becomes codified, uh, perhaps it becomes a, a commodity function, uh, things get standardized, and they tend to move away from the individual applications. And just um, a simple example, back in the early days of PCs, we used to have um, a lot of word processing uh, options. Today, you don't have uh, quite as many. But the function of doing grammar checks or spell checks or um, looking for style, that was a separate application. You'd go out and you'd, if you were writing a magazine column, for example, you would use your word processor. But you'd have another application that would look at it and give you some feedback. Those things gradually moved down. We'd have uh, components. So now if you look at um, oh, OS X, for example, I happen to be using um, a Mac here. Uh, there are functions in the operating system that are now available to all of the applications, like uh, speech to text. So if you uh, want to dictate into an application, it's not what we would think of as a very smart um, function. It doesn't do much interpretation, but it's the same interface that's in every uh, that's available in every application because it's in one place. It's in the operating system. Some things that we may have had separately for security, for example, maybe you'd have an application that we'd be doing at the front end. Now a lot of those things migrate down, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is uh, hardware is always going to be really kind of the last frontier for optimizing. You can't run a system without hardware, and it's easier to, to prototype and to get things um, organized and test the functionality in software because changes are very, uh, very simple, uh, relatively simple, I should say, instead of going out and you know, burning a new chip. But as things become more stable, and uh, the volume of use goes up, a lot of times it will make sense economically uh, to optimize it to, as I say here, commoditize and standardize. So you move things down into hardware. The other thing is, that as we um, look at emerging areas where we're building systems like um, AI, you'll find that there are just some problems that you can't optimize sufficiently just in software. So if the volume of data reaches a point where uh, you can solve the problem, but you can't solve it in time to be useful, let's say um, you're doing weather forecasting, for example, uh, a forecast is no good if it comes the day after the weather. You could have just looked out the window. So you need to have sort of this balance between software and hardware optimization. And with that, let's look at how this applies specifically to the area that we're calling modern AI. And I keep hammering home this word modern because one of the issues that we run into, if you look at uh, AI over the course of the last few decades, artificial intelligence, and now we're looking at it as uh, a set of functions that may be augmented intelligence, not just artificial intelligence. It's something that you, you do as a, an assistant or an assisted um, intelligence, has for decades looked at simulating either the function or the behavior of natural systems. So AI would include things like um, cognition, and we'll look specifically at what we include in cognitive computing and how that, that fits with hardware in a minute. But it also includes things like uh, vision processing and understanding uh, pattern matching, that type of thing. But for a very long time, and really up until quite recently uh, in the greater scheme of things, conventional AI did not include machine learning. Machine learning, uh, as we know it today, very focused on uh, neural networks and on models that are uh, what we call brain-inspired. And that has changed the way we look at AI. If you read 50 articles in the popular press this week, um, probably 
all of them will have some reference to the impact of machine learning. So when we look at uh, AI functions supported by machine learning, the third component that makes what I call modern AI is the availability of big data, and not just the availability of the data set, but the availability of data management solutions that allow you to get access to what you need, um, improve it, if you will, through machine learning, and then do the kind of processing that we think of as more traditional AI. So those are the three things, when I say modern AI, that distinguish it from any other uh, view of the world. What we want to look at is, given that, that AI includes so many things, and in modern AI, we're going to focus on the idea of cognition. What is the role for hardware, and where do we need this optimization within cognitive, within input and output, and as machines talk to people, but also talk to each other to get into the IoT world? Um, and I'm not going to go through these point by point. There's no you know, single slide for some of them, but uh, since I know everybody gets a copy of the slides um, next week, this will just help uh, refresh your memory in terms of how we're organizing these thoughts. Put this all together, and this is, I promise, the, uh, the most, uh, sorry, just lost my trackpad there. The, uh, hmm. there we go. The busiest diagram that we have today. So when we look at cognitive computing uh, as a distinct part of uh, modern AI, uh, the definitions are all over the place, and some of them seem to be pretty vendor-specific. Um, I include four things under cognitive computing. It's learning, understanding, reasoning, and planning. And so this center here in the red in the red circle is what we think of as a cognitive computing system. Uh, probably the group that's doing the most to promote it as a commercial concept is IBM, and they use three out of the four. They use uh, learn, understand, and reason. And within reason, you've got things like um, inductive, deductive, and abductive reasoning. But the reason I put it all together uh, in this diagram is that's kind of the, the core and within that, you have a model. Uh, each of the other four are, are verbs here, to, to plan, to learn, et cetera. This is a, the noun of a model, which is the data that you have internally and the assumptions that you have about the world around you. So if we think of the center as being the cognitive system, um, we'll see that there are a number of places that that can be optimized using uh, new hardware. But it's important to look at uh, the idea that a system like this really doesn't have much value if it doesn't communicate with the outside world. So everything on the left side of the diagram refers to uh, data that's coming into this cognitive system, either from people or from machines. And of course, if you're going to be uh, technical, it's always coming from a machine, but it may be coming from a human first. So if we're looking at a system and we want to be able to accept natural language input, for example, uh, we want to be able to monitor emotions using sensors or gestures. We've talked about that in a couple of the other um, webinars. We need to be able to get that data in. And so I've got this layer on the outside, which is where we do the data management. And that's the key because we're dealing in, in modern um, AI with a lot more data than we were just a few years ago. So the data constraints and how we get this data in and how we organize it are much more, um, uh, more difficult to deal with, uh, and the expectations are uh, much higher than they were just a few years ago. At the bottom left, we're looking at machine-to-machine -machine communication, so we're either coming in through sensors, what you think of as um, IoT, or through other systems, so you're, you're going out and you're reading stuff in batch. On the right side, uh, and I've done a version of this in the past, uh, at the top, this to me is where it's the most interesting, is where the system is producing output uh, that could be in natural language. We're talking nar narrative generation or um, natural language generation, NLG, as part of natural language processing. We're talking about visualization, data that's uh, being presented uh, for human consumption, versus what we have at the bottom 
which is we've got a machine, it's uh, intelligent in the cognitive sense, and it's producing information that's going to be used by another system. So if you look at this in the context and say, okay, where might we want to uh, leverage emerging um, hardware architectures to improve the performance? What are the bottlenecks that we're dealing with here? So keep this diagram in mind for just a second, and I'm gonna compare it to how a person uh, gets input. So we're just gonna look at the kind of the top half of the diagram for a minute and think, how do we get input as people um, before we process it? And then how do we get it out? And see what the human architecture looks like and then compare it. What's the volume of data that we need to process and how do we actually look at it? So I know that in the, um, the description that I wrote for this months ago, I said, you don't need to know anything about computer architecture. And I hope that's, that's true. I'm not making uh, too many assumptions. But I'm hoping that you have a, a vague idea of um, how you get information naturally. So we've got the five senses, and we have neuro, um, neurosynaptic uh, receptors, if you will, for each of those. And in some modern biology books or uh, neuropsychology books, you'll see six and seven senses talking about um, how balance and uh, some other factors um, are processed. Uh, if you've ever had vertigo, you know that there's a, another um, issue here that isn't actually covered. But really, all of those, the sensing part comes in through one or more of these five senses. And just to give you an order of scale, when you're hearing, um, natural uh, hearing with one or two ears, audio reception, each ear has about 12,000 of these outer hair cells in the, uh, the basilar membrane. They vibrate and it gets down to the 3,500 inner hair cells. So that's a fair amount of um, data that's coming in that we don't even think about as we process it. We, we tend to think more about um, issues for vision where we have photoreceptors. And here, uh, I always laugh because it's one of the few things I remember from uh, my perception class in college. We got rods and cones that are uh, being triggered by uh, light, by the, the photons. So you got 120 million rod cells, roughly per eye, six million cone cells, and cone cells require more light to trigger. And you got another 60,000 photosensitive ganglion cells. It's really almost miraculous if you, you look at the eye uh, and the the um, ophthalmoception uh, system that we can process this as quickly as we can. And if you think about what, uh, what you have to do with a computer to be able to do that, if you've got a camera and you're then taking that input, to be able to process that in time, uh, even roughly approximating what you could do as a human, that's a lot of processing. We won't get into the, the actual details of how many um, cells are dealing, how many receptors for taste and smell and touch. But basically the idea is, the idea here was to say, okay, which of these things can we do fairly easily with computers and which require uh, some extra hardware, if you will, or extra power? And if you've ever done um, audio recording today with digital recorders, you know that the hearing part, capturing that in a way that's um, that has sufficient fidelity that you could uh, use the recording capturing it digitally is actually pretty simple for you know 100 bucks you can buy a, a digital recorder that will capture at a similar level of accuracy because it samples the signal coming in it has uh, sufficient bandwidth and everything so that the fact that we've got these 12,000 outer cells and 3,500 inner cells that's dead easy on very simple hardware dealing with uh, an accurate processing of visual information is much more difficult. But if put it all in perspective, go to the next one, human cognition where all of this comes in and we interpret it, I've overlaid this on the cognitive computing model with learn, understand, reason, and plan. We have roughly 100 billion neurons in a functioning human brain 
and somewhere between 100 to 500 trillion synapses. So the synapses are the connections between the neurons, if you will. And it's it, to try and process the same type of information that we process very naturally and very easily as a human being. If you look at it this way, there's a lot of data there that needs to be processed. And a lot of it we do in parallel naturally um, because we don't break things down into, into those simple steps. Uh, when you think about how you know, the, your brain hardware works, if you will, without worrying about uh, too much in the, in the neurobiology, you don't really have to stop and think, uh, I hear a noise and it's probably my garage and the next sound I'm going to hear is the dog barking. You have a lot of things in your model that help you, but you can uh, navigate and deal with um, novel situations because you can process so much information so quickly. Okay. One more and then we'll get into the actual architecture. And that's uh, going back to the idea of this machine learning. And again, if you're reading anything in the popular press today, you would think that all of AI is, is deep learning. But the issue here that I wanna hammer home and then we'll get into the, the three types of architecture that we can use to deal with this is that when we're dealing with deep learning, we're dealing with a system that models the world as a set of um, neurosynaptic connections, if you will, which are very simple. If you think about that, that we've got how many billions of, uh, I say 100 billion um, neurons, and then we've got uh, trillions of synapses. Each of those is a, an electrochemical um, connection that by itself is very simple. It's not something like a, a computer CPU, but it's the connections between them and the way they work together that allow you to solve these bigger problems. So a modern neural network uh, can work in any type of uh, machine learning environment, but they, the key is that you have to somehow model a system that can take in all this data, these hundreds of trillions, if you will, uh, synapses and connections, and process them, learn from them, and then produce some output. And that is where things get uh, tricky. So I promise that uh, you wouldn't already have to know about architecture, so I'm gonna give you one slide here uh, that is sort of the standard uh, freshman computer science. This is the von Neumann architecture that everybody talks about. You've got a CPU, your central processing unit, which includes um, hardware for control and hardware for the ALU, the arithmetic logical unit. This is where the data comes in, it's processed, very simple instructions. At this level, you're dealing with you know, um, a few to a few hundred different instructions. That's where we're dealing with the ones and zeros that are in memory, and the memory can hold instructions and data in a von Neumann architecture. So put it all together. You've got your input coming from some device, perhaps it's your keyboard. You've got your output, maybe going to a printer, and you've got uh, data in memory. It all gets, uh, communicates with each other through the operating system. Great, but the issue that we run into is there are all these places where uh, you can get bogged down. You can get um, bound by computation or bound by too much um, communication. So the, the actual CPU has a theoretical limit, the number of cycles, the number of instructions it can process in a, a given amount of time. If you're buying a new laptop, you'll see what the clock speed is. That's what this is all about. Um, the, the speed of the memory itself, again, you can look at your PC or your, uh, your Mac or your telephone uh, specifications and see what the speed is of the memory. But then you've got the speed going between the memory and the CPU. So with all of that, if this is the architecture that you're using, the only way to make it faster when you're dealing with uh, a problem like uh, computer vision is you make the memory component faster, you make the control and the uh, ALU faster, and you make the communication faster. But that's where we run into limits. It's the, uh, 
what everybody talks about in terms of Moore's Law. There are limits to, and Moore's Law very simply is looking at um, the number of transistors in a, a chip, the density, because the more you have and the closer they are, uh, the speed of electrons going through a circuit is a constant. Uh, so the closer they are, the faster things are going to be, the faster the clock. But there comes a point where you just can't speed this up by itself um, anymore. It's, it's either cost or physics prohibited. So what we've done uh, in the architectural world over the last several decades is to get in and uh, change the hardware around so that we have multiple cores. And a core is sort of a processing unit, if you will. So within one computer, within one chipset, we may have multiple cores. And that's great. That allows you, if the problem itself can be partitioned into separate pieces that can be run in parallel, the operating system or the application is gonna take that data, split it up and assign it to the right um, processor. So think about it this way. If you had to uh, lay floor tile on a 10 by 10 room and your floor tiles were one foot square, you got 100 tiles put down, you could pretty well figure out how long it was going to take you. And now if you had to do three of those rooms, all right, it would take you three times as long. Or you could have three people working in parallel. You'd have a little bit of overhead there. You're handing out the things. Um, if you just had to do the one room, Having three people would be too much overhead. You get in each other's way. If you had to do 100 rooms or if you had to do a room that's 1,000 by 1,000, you would want to partition it. And this is kind of the way you would do it. You would say, okay, I'm going to break it off. And perhaps uh, instead of having all the same color floor tiles, now you want to make it a checkerboard. Again, this is more overhead. This is where we start to get um, the operating system and the control system has to be able to handle that. But there are some limits. So what we want to look at is at what point do we need to go um, just many, many more cores, and at what point do we need to change the fundamental architecture? So last month we talked about um, how IBM Watson handled deep QA. And I pointed out then that they used 90 servers with 32 cores per server. So the, the, the system, which was pretty impressive, is 2,880 cores. And think about that, that. The problem that they were solving could be partitioned into up to 2,800 pieces that could be run in parallel. So what are the limits that we run into? And we'll see that this is why uh, we're changing the fundamental architecture. Amdahl's law, named after Gene Amdahl, who is um, an ex-IBMer who founded his own company that made Amdahl computers, uh, is credited with, with this insight, which is that the theoretical performance improvement that you can get from improving any one resource uh, for a fixed workload, and a workload is a set of steps and the data that goes with it, the improvement you can get is limited by the part of the workload that can't benefit from it. It's a convoluted way of uh, looking at the world, but basically to net it out, it means that if you have a job like putting those floor tiles down, there's part of it that can be done in parallel and part of it that can't, the, the organizational part. So the, the limiting factor is the organizational part, but you can speed up the others theoretically uh, to approach zero. Now, on the left, we have my MacBook, 2.6 gigahertz. It's got a quad core um, Intel i7. So the MacBook has uh, four cores, which is pretty much, um, it's run of the mill these days, all right? And when I'm running a video processing application, I can see that all those cores are being used and I'm really straining the machine. If you look at the specs here, this is um, Milky Way 2. This happens to have been one that I've been tracking uh, last year and for a few years, it was the fastest supercomputer in the world. You've got um, 3 million cores, all right? It's um, a couple of hundred thousand, um, a couple hundred thousand processors. These are all pretty much off the shelf uh, Intel Xeon um, processors. And if you look at the specs, each 
um, each chipset has 12 cores and each core is running or each clock runs the 12 cores is running at 2.2 gigahertz. So my, my MacBook Pro is actually faster if you can't parallelize the, uh, the application that you're dealing with than the fastest supercomputer in the world because I'm running at 2.6 gigahertz, they're only running at 2.2. But they can take a big problem and spread it out over 3 million cores. Remember that the, uh, the, the Watson system was just under 3,000 cores. Uh, I don't have the specs up on, on here today. The, the fastest as of June of this year, I think, is running about 10 million um, cores. So the issue is how do we take advantage of this? Because if you're running 3 million cores divided by 12, you've got a couple hundred thousand um, computers that need to communicate with each other. For most applications, that's not going to work. It's too too much uh, communication. So we need to leverage the power of parallelism or find something else that will allow us to break up the problems and solve them simultaneously or solve them in a different way. And that's where we get to the first of the three architectures. So when we think of neuromorphic architectures or so-called brain-inspired architectures, the key here is that the devices or the components, uh, we could have a neuromorphic computer or device, we could have a chipset that goes in another device, they're neuromorphic. And the real key here is that these are modeled after the biological systems like the brain with uh, neurons and synapses. They can be implemented in analog circuitry or digital circuitry. We'll, we'll stick with digital for uh, the moment so that everything's consistent. But the real key here is that each um, processor that has to operate in parallel is very simple. So the, the data that you would have to record for a processor within a um, neuromorphic architecture is similar to the data that you're recording or that the brain handles at one of those trillions of synapses. So communication between and uh, communication and cooperation as these systems learn, if you think about things that you may have read about uh, like deep learning algorithms for looking at images, they go through multiple layers and the first one may just look for uh, light and dark and then we get take that information and you pass it up to the next layer and we're looking for edges and then we're looking for features. But each at each um, place where there's a processor, it's only very simple things that are being done rather than looking at uh, having to have hundreds or hundreds of thousands of full computers like um, an Intel Xeon or Motorola, whoever's making the chip. So these have been um, in the research phase for quite some time, the European Commission uh, FACETS system, uh, Spinnaker. Uh, I'm most, personally, I'm most familiar with DARPA, the System of Neuromorphic Adaptive Plastic Scalable Electronics, because I've actually um, talked to some of the people that are developing these and we've, we've seen examples. And in fact, on the next slide, on the left is an IBM Synapse board, and that is my aging iPad that I happen to have with me when uh, when I was looking at this board, so you can just see for scale. This is the Synapse um, board as it was, I think, two or three years ago. What I have on the rest of the slide shows what they're doing uh, today. So they've already demonstrated a uh, chipset with 16 million neurons and 4 billion synapses. And for scale, this is um, the one there with the 16 chip board. Uh, I think it's approximately the same size as the, the one I have on the iPad. And then if you look, um, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but on the uh, upper right, this is the new True North chip, which is 64 by 64 cores. So each of those, um, it's blown up in the, the far right, is doing that one thing. It's looking at its nearest neighbor. It's seeing if a neuron is firing. And these systems are now um, at the point where they're being manufactured in, uh, primarily for research. But you can just take the chip, tile it together with others. And so if you think about the example of putting tiles on a floor, here you're putting tiles together to create a larger and larger brain out of smaller, simple ones. 
And what's important here is that the because they're only drawing power as they're firing, if you will, like a, a neuron, it's almost like when you sleep, you're using less, uh, uh, less power in your brain. Their goal right now is to do a um, 4K of chips within a single rack that represents uh, 4 billion neurons, do the math to figure out how many uh, synapses that is, but um, all running at four, uh, around four, uh, kilowatts of power. So it's much less than what you would have for comparable power today. So this is you know, a quick overview of the neuromorphic architectures, but what I think is uh, really exciting is that at this scale, we're talking about something that isn't commercial. You can't just go out and buy it. But in the next slide, and I'm sorry, I know this looks like a, a Qualcomm ad. Qualcomm is uh, is not a client of mine. I've uh, spoken with them a number of times about what they're doing here. Um, what is the date on this? So the the Qualcomm set, the 0F NPU, or Neural Processing Unit, uh, has been out for about two years commercially. And then this uh, a couple of months ago, um, they announced that you can now go out and get an SDK to do embedded machine intelligence. And this uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Qualcomm or, or you know, where they're uh, going with this, this is something that would fit in a telephone handset. So the impressive thing here is that it's using a neuro or brain-inspired model with um, these neurosynaptic connections in the hardware instead of having a von Neumann architecture where everything goes through that channel and your, um, your limiting factor is uh, getting data in and out between memory and the processor. Here you've got all these working in parallel. Each one is very simple, but with the SDK so that you can actually write your code for it, it's, a, a, it's now giving you the ability to model behavior and to start to get information uh, as people use their handsets. And so you can write applications based on this. It's commercially out there today. So neuromorphic is no longer uh, the future, it's, it's the present. It's going to scale up um, with the other types of things that are going on. But right now, this is uh, probably the most advanced architecture that you can see uh, that you can literally put in your pocket. Look quickly at the next category, which is GPUs or graphical processing units and advanced memory architectures. And will give a couple of examples here. Um, Again, going back to the laptop um, for many years now, uh, most mid to high end laptops and, and um, desktop machines have, in addition to the CPU, which may be multi core, had GPUs or graphical processing units um, originally brought in for things like gaming or for improving uh, the visual display. But uh, more recently, in the last few years, as people are building more and more um, AI or cognitive systems, we realized that by using a GPU, um, instead of having the, the fundamental unit just be a CPU, you have the CPU with a GPU. GPUs uh, generally have many, many more cores than you would find um, on your CPU, on your, your, your core processor. So here's an NVIDIA uh, as an example. And NVIDIA, as we'll see at the end, is pretty much the market leader in this space, largely coming from their sale of GPUs um, to manufacturers that are building systems for people that want to do video editing or gaming, something that really requires a, you know, the, the visual display similar to the idea of rods and cones. It's, a, it's kind of a parallel uh, system here. But this one, which fits in a simple rack, um, it would fit in your, your desktop computer, has 3,000 cores. So one GPU has more cores than, you would, than we found in the, um, the Watson system. So it, that's a little misleading because the, the Watson system had um, 2,800 um, CPU cores, if you were to think of it in those terms, they also had GPUs going along with it. But it's the idea of scaling up. If you can scale up and partition the 
data that you're working with, and this, this is where we get into the limiting factor, that the operating system and the application needs to be able to leverage these GPUs. They don't automatically just say that the GPU doesn't um, go out and find the data. Then for a much lower cost than you would have and a much lower energy consumption than you would have um, by getting more CPU cores, by dedicating the GPUs um, to vision, <clears throat> sorry, vision handling or um, uh, using it as a um, substitute for a, a neural processor, it's a way of improving performance drastically above what we would have just a couple of years ago. So I'm going to give a couple of quick um, examples here. This is one of the, uh, the leaders in the market. Um, so just to, to look at the way they can be um, scaled, the way they can be put together, they can be packaged. Um, in, in this case, uh, in, in the system stack there, you'll see that at the bottom, you've got a GPU optimized version of Linux. And one thing I uh, could have mentioned when I showed the, the specs for that, um, the Chinese supercomputer that was uh, tops in the world for a couple of years, Virtually all of the top 500 computer installations, supercomputer installations in the world, just about everybody is running um, an optimized version of Linux uh, as the underlying operating system. So here's one where you can um, do your own deep neural network using GPUs that are packaged um, on top of Linux. A couple of months ago, I talked about um, tensor processing and mentioned that Google had a uh, had a language and a um, and had open sourced their tensor processing um, software, uh, which which is pretty cool from a, a software um, perspective. But now, just recently, uh, in May, uh, they are talking about and making available, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, hardware, custom chips, that are specifically optimized to process um, the, the TensorFlow language, the TensorFlow instructions. And so if you um, are familiar with the recent um, competition where uh, Google beat um, a master for the game of Go with AlphaGo, this is what was underneath it. It was optimized hardware just built to run TensorFlow uh, with massively parallel uh, software. So this is not something where uh, you know, you're going to go to your Radio Shack if you still have one in town and buy it. But we can see that these things are coming from the lab <coughs> excuse me, and um, starting to become available. So next. It's kind of interesting to me that uh, Facebook has been building their own and is now uh, open sourcing their design for GPU hardware. And uh, you know, when you get the slides, you can take a look at some of these references. Could I put uh, links for for each of these uh, projects? So in this case, they're building. They've built their own GPU hardware for their software that reads the stories and, and does the questions and does the recommendations, et cetera, that you know, you're all familiar with if you actually use uh, Facebook. At the back end, because of the volume of data and because of the, the latency requirements, they built hardware to do this, and now they're open sourcing um, the actual design of that to the Open Compute Project, so other manufacturers will be able to uh, build systems based on this design. Excuse me. All right. Um, the last couple here, in, in terms of the the GPU and advanced memory, Micron is another um, one of the top companies in the the GPU space. But they're also building um, what they call here the automata processor, which is kind of bridging the gap, if you will, between uh, a substitute for a standard CPU with a GPU and putting the data so that the operations are happening in memory. <laughs> Sorry. So 
it, it, as it says, it's not a memory device, it's memory based. So it, what happens is if you look at um, RAM memory, if you look at um, the way memory is organized, it's very fast, it's uh, silicon based here, but things are happening in parallel, things are being moved in parallel, the, the bits are being moved in parallel, if you will. And so what they've done is uh, created an architecture that's more memory based that's pushing down some of the processing into the memory rather than taking the data from the memory into the processor. Um, technically, it's, it's faster memory in the processor that, that's actually doing it in the registers, but basically it's moving the processing to where the data is to speed it up. So this is still a, a case of um, conventional design conceptually in that you're still dealing with ones and zeros and it's being partaken that way, but it's um, it, it gives you some huge performance advantages over the traditional von Neumann where everything has to come into um, the, the registers and the ALU before it gets acted on. So it's by distributing the processing just as we saw in the neuromorphic where it's distributed to these very simple machines, here it would be distributed to fewer but more complex, if you will, um, automata processors. Uh, last one in this section that I wanted to point out, this is still in the, the early stages, um, a deep learning processor. This is the same idea of um, pushing things into memory. So you can think of it as the hardware, um, uh, integration, if you will, of memory and processing. <coughs> Dying here. All right, now I'm going to um, wrap up this section by looking at uh, the issue of quantum computing. And the the thing that I want people to understand when you think, well, am I likely to be using quantum computing? Is is this something? Um, quantum computing is much further out than the other two that I've just talked about, and I'll, I'll put it all together in a summary slide, but the fundamental thing with quantum computers is instead of dealing with bits, uh, where a bit is a binary digit, it's a zero or a one, it has two states, that's why we deal in base two, we deal in binary, everything is a power of two. Um, it uses properties of quantum physics, quantum mechanics, where each bit is called a qubit, um, can be in the state of uh, on, off, or both, what's called superposition. And while you're getting your mind around that, if you haven't looked at it before, I'll tell you that the, the big issue here is that it, it requires um, material physics properties such that the actual system has to be kept at a very cold operating temperature. So this slide will, um, will summarize sort of the three um, levels of sophistication for quantum computers. So if you hear somebody saying, oh yeah, you know, we, we've, we've built a quantum computer and it's got six qubits, um, which I think was the, the measure of volume for the arc. What they're talking about here is um, a measure of computing power in the very simplest way of thinking about it. If you think every time you um, add a bit in um, a standard computer, you double the amount of information that you can store, right? Because a bit, um, uh, if it becomes another meaningful uh, part of your representation, it's um, times two of whatever you had before. Well, here, if you're just dealing with the simplest view of the world where you're dealing with three states, then every time you add one, you're um, raising it uh, another power of three. There are a lot more um, interesting things that go along with it if you're you're working on algorithms that are uh, dealing with quantum mechanics, but it has some general properties that are making it um, of interest to people who are working in uh, um, sorry, cognitive computing because of the speed and because of the, the volume they can handle. Uh, the reason I included this one, although you Again, you can't just go out and buy it. Um, you can go out and use um, the IBM um, Quantum Simulator, where you can just go to the address on here and get a um, get an account, and you can start to learn about um, quantum computing, if you will, which requires a completely different um, model for instructions. 
because they've made it available for free for research uh, and it's cloud-based. Uh, but that brings up another point. For any meaningful application, you're going to still need a conventional computer to pre-process the information for the quantum computer. So there's a lot of training involved and there's a lot of uh, infrastructure involved because of the, the cold. Um, I'll just uh, throw this up, not that I'm expecting anybody uh, to go out and read the paper, but this is a, a fairly recent paper, again, July uh, and revised here. What's interesting about this one to me, uh, they're looking at, uh, it's called quantum supremacy. The, the article here, and I'll freely admit, uh, I never made it through it because we're dealing in 42 qubits in uh, chaos theory. But what's most interesting to me is that this is coming from our old friends at Google. And Google has uh, talked about it and Google is working very diligently to extend the state of the art in quantum computers. They started out working with a Canadian company called D-Wave uh, and now they're building their own. And I think that what we're seeing here is that because of the almost intractable problems they're dealing with, with the size, the volume of the data and the speed of the data and the complexity of the data that Google deals with, they've had to uh, develop research that has them in the hardware business, if you will. And it's the same thing with Facebook. It's all based on this push from big data. So I'll show one last uh, thing just to uh, sort of as a brain teaser. MIT is currently working on a thing they call the probabilistic computing project. And that gets into uh, hardware and software. I don't believe that they've actually uh, demoed or built the, any of the hardware yet. But one of the things that we look at in uh, cognitive systems is that a lot of times we're dealing with probabilistic um, problem solving, something where there isn't uh, probabilistic as contrasted with deterministic. So one uh, set of facts may lead you to multiple uh, um, next steps, if you will, if you think about this in finite automata. Um, which is probably not how I should represent it. Um, but if you're at one place and you get another input, uh, that could send you off to multiple next steps. Uh, you don't know from the beginning where you're going. You don't know perhaps uh, what the sequence of steps was to get you there. They're working at MIT on this um, probabilistic uh, representation language and building hardware to go with it. So with that, I'm going to kind of pull it all together and say, where are we today? Um, the, the bottom line is that as we start to build these cognitive systems that are going to, uh, again, learn, reason, um, understand, and plan, we're dealing with volumes of data uh, that are pretty much unprecedented for consumer applications and, and even for many enterprise applications that require us to process that data in parallel, either by partitioning it using GPUs or coming up with a system that, uh, like the neuromorphics that represent everything in very, in more processors, if you will, more cores uh, that are very tiny to have more communication overhead, or we're gonna have to do something uh, completely different and go into a multi-state uh, bit like a qubit. So where we are today, the GPU um, approach has been, it's a natural evolution, if you will, from what we've done uh, in architectures from gaming, from video. Uh, it, it's proven, it's a proven approach for parallelism and it's relatively, I won't hesitate to say easy, but it's um, they're built to be interoperable with the conventional systems. So most of the people that are listening today probably have a GPU um, on your desk in your device. If you're going to scale up and build a cognitive system, <clears throat> one of the things to look at is uh, how much of the, the workload can be allocated to GPUs, to these memory accelerators, so that you don't need to scale up with multiple processors. Neuromorphic, um, I read this as, as very promising, that it's ready now at the handset level. It's, it's been out there for a year or two. The key things to consider here are that the model 
for programming is going to be a little different, but it's based on a behavioral process model, which should be more natural to people than as we get into quantum. And these things are, have very low power requirements. The downside is that there's going to be new, uh, a new software model and skills that you didn't need to have before to build applications. Quantum, it's very promising. Uh, Google's looking at having something out in, in a year or two. But if you're building systems now and you're looking at it for your company and you're building it for you know, a couple of the, the industries that are well represented in these webinars are financial services, insurance, pharma, healthcare. If you want to build something now, you're probably not looking at, at, at quantum. It's something that you, I think that people should be watching but not waiting for because you can already do much of what you want to do with either the GPUs um, or if you're dealing at the... Um, the mobile level with neuromorphic. So we're going to uh, close it out by looking at kind of the state of the market. I've mentioned some of these companies. Uh, we'll go from right to left um, in, in terms of stuff to just keep an eye on. Uh, for quantum, IBM, D-Wave, and Google are doing some of the most interesting stuff. They've got the most money invested in this. Um, and basically, uh, with reasonable confidence, I can say that the next generation is going to come from one of these companies or a spinoff. With Neuromorphic, uh, IBM, in the U.S. anyway, um, is certainly the leader at the, the high end with the Synapse work. Uh, Qualcomm is, um, by everything that I've seen, a leader at the, um, the mobile end. And the companies that I referenced on an earlier slide or the, the research projects that I referenced on an earlier slide are representative of the work that's going on in Europe uh, on uh, brain-inspired hardware. So now the column on the left, this is where the action is right now. You've got uh, NVIDIA is uh, certainly the leader in GPUs. Uh, Intel has done a couple of acquisitions that I mentioned here. Uh, in particular, they just announced one for Mobidius which is uh, basically a, a um, coprocessor. All of these are coprocessors uh, that's optimized for vision processing and Google with their tensor processing. <coughs> so commercial off the shelf, you're looking at 90% um, or more would be NVIDIA, Intel, or AMD. And I've just listed some of the companies that are on the horizon. They're doing interesting things um, in the GPU space. Uh, Base and with a little work on, uh, on neuromorphic. And with that, I think I've just about blown my time budget. Uh, we'll open it up to questions, but I wanted to give you a, a peek at the, the schedule for the next 13 months. Um, barring something unforeseen where we have to change it because there's some radical new, um, new invention that we need to cover. So Shannon, can I hand it back to you and see if anybody has any questions today? Otherwise, awesome. Yeah, everyone's pretty quiet today. But um, these, I love seeing these these titles. I'm really excited about next year and for next month as well. Um, just a reminder to everyone, uh, so if you want to submit a question, submit it in the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner there. We've got just a couple minutes left if you've got a question. Uh, to, and to answer some of the most popular questions, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Um, and yeah, everyone's pretty quiet today. I think everyone's still in uh, uh, recovering from the, the week's events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Yep. <laughs> my, my cognitive um, system didn't call it, so I'll I'll just leave it at that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited Adrian, about next year's um, sessions. We're going to be working to uh, build everything out uh, pretty quickly here. Oh, so we got a quick question here in for you. Which computing architecture is appropriate for high velocity data like autonomous vehicle data that sends multiple gigabytes of files every 10 seconds? Whew. Which architecture for autonomous vehicles? That was the question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, right now you could rule out uh, anything with quantum, uh, you know, unless you're only driving in the Arctic. Um, I would say that for the vehicle itself, uh, today you're talking about uh, a parallel architecture with GPUs. 
And if someone is interested in that, you want to just shoot me an email. Um, there are a couple that are really being optimized for autonomous vehicles, but it, it, it's primarily a, a GPU oriented approach. Short and sweet, I love it. And we're right at the top of the hour, it's perfect. Um, and again, just so just a reminder, we will, um, I'll send the materials out to everyone in email. Um, and we'll get to all, yes, and so I will also include uh, Adrian's information there uh, as well as in the follow-up email. So you have all that as, in addition to what's printed in the slides. Adrian, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation and another great, um, another great month. And thanks to our attendees for being engaged in everything we do. We hope to see you next month. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks.